Are you tired of being tired? Stop just surviving and find out exactly where to focus your energy and attention. I'm going to give you access to realistic tools to confidently manage your energy, emotions, and impact. Head on over to Heather Chauvin, C-H-A-U-V-I-N dot com forward slash life quiz and take the aligned life quiz today. It's free. And not only am I going to show you which pillar to focus on of inner leadership. Do you need to focus on managing your energy and time? Do you need to focus on boundaries, getting a deeper sense of purpose in your life or your emotional triggers? And are you living in a state of survival mode, momentum, thrival, or abundance? This two-minute quiz will show you how and where to focus your energy and attention. So instead of feeling like you're playing whack-a-mole all over and overwhelmed with where to start, I'm going to show you how. Head on over to Heather Chauvin, C-H-A-U-V-I-N dot com forward slash life quiz. I never set out to be one of those people whose vibrator went off in the TSA line, let alone rolling with a bag of them through the airport. Turns out that no amount of double checking that every off switch was in the correct position or removal of all the batteries could save me from that mortifying moment. Several years ago, I was in LA for the annual biohacking conference, and I was making guest appearances on several podcasts, including Sex with Emily, with the astoundingly knowledgeable and playful host, Dr. Emily Morse. If you haven't heard of her, she's the Dr. Ruth of the 2020s. Check her out. So it should come as no surprise when I tell you that this woman took my sex toy knowledge and collection to the next level. Her parting gift to me was a trip to a well-organized closet of adult goodies, including dildos, vibrators, loops, and more. She excitedly asked what I would like as I stood there with my eyes wide and jaw hanging slightly open. I had so many thoughts. I was excited. I wanted to choose wisely, like I was Indiana Jones presented with the Holy Grail or a kid at Willy Wonka's factory. Because what does it say about me if I tell her I want this one and I don't choose another? Excitement ultimately won, with each of us swapping stories while Emily placed one toy after another in my hands. I'd seriously gotten the golden ticket here until like a small baby, my arms were holding a trove of toys. The crew managed to find me a tote, but that contained only so many. Cue the image of me climbing into an Uber with toys spilling across the back seat. Wait for it. It gets even more awkward. As I arrived at my hotel before my evening flight, I had to cross the lobby filled with colleagues, including people who had come to the conference just to see me. And my brain reminded me that in the age of social media, yes, everyone does have a phone. I made it to my hotel room undetected. Phew. Oh my God, why did I have to take the magic wand, I sighed. As I tried to fit the monstrous beast of pleasure into my bag, I pressed on, trying different configurations, double checking that each item was going to be cool and that none of the... (laughs) I'm starting to make myself laugh and that none of them would go popping off as we went through airport security. Fortunately, my Tetris skills were on lock that day and everyone, including my cute shoes, made it in the bag. At LAX the next day, I found myself unjustifiably confident that getting through security was going to be more than fine. Without a hitch, I made my way through the airport and placed my bag on the conveyor belt. You got this, I thought, giving myself an inner wink. Then my bag stopped, reversed, then moved forward again. Nope, stopped, back it up. Okay, here it goes. Nope. I can only imagine what I looked like watching my bag go back and forth until it came to a halt and the TSA agent gave me a glance. He called yet another agent to his side. I felt the knots in my stomach begin to build and twist. Then I saw the giggles. Wait, they're laughing? Oh my God, this is funny to them? I watched their eyes dart from the x-ray to me. Then it hit me. I was wearing faux leather leather leggings with black thigh-high boots and a leopard blouse, had bright red lips, and had a bag full of sex toys. 
No, I had not in fact thought this through. As their eyes made their way to me, I decided to embrace the awkward. Listen, I called to the agents. I have a suitcase full of sex toys. I'm more than happy to open it up and show you them and answer any questions you might have. Their eyes quickly met the floor, faces turning red. Then one gave a short, that's okay, as my bag was spat out onto the conveyor. As I grabbed my bag, one female agent asked me, okay, so what is it that you do? I laughed and said, would you believe I'm a doctor? She raised one eyebrow and said, I think I need a doctor like you. We shared a laugh and I made it to my plane just in time to grab my seat. I love that. <laughs> one of my many most awkward moments in sex. <laughs> the best introduction to a podcast ever. And yes, a declaration to just show up and be you. I love it. <laughs> and for people who like audiobooks, uh, when I read this, I had a producer. So there were, there, she made me stop when I started giggling. And uh, it's much more refined <laughs> than what I just did. But my audiobook was really hard to get through because in every chapter of the book, there are moments where I'm like, did I really write that? Um, but I just think that if you're learning about your body and hormones and sex, it should be fun and enjoyable. And we know giggling is good for our hormones. A hundred percent. So I'm so excited to have this conversation with you. So welcome for being welcome. And thank you for being here, Dr. Jolene Brighton. Yes. Um, thank you so much for having me. So is this your second book? This is my third book. Okay. And do you get like, tell me the difference between this book and your other books? Okay. So the very first book is on postpartum health. So it's everything you need to know after you have a baby, focusing on healing your body naturally. So I had a lot of patients that would come to me for fertility. They would go on their pregnancy journey. And at the end, they found themselves in the very same place I found myself, which is postpartum, six week check. That's it. Goodbye. You can have sex and you can have exercise. And you're in six weeks being like, I don't want to move. I'm so tired. And also my vagina still hurts. What do you mean I can have sex? Mm -hmm. So I wrote a postpartum book to really just being the guide that women could use to understand their body and to really DIY at home because the things that come up, they always come up in the middle of the night. So that's book number one, healing your body naturally after childbirth. And the subtitle is The New Mom's Guide to Navigating the Fourth Trimester. And let me say when that book came out and I named it that, and then like four years later, everybody had a fourth trimester book. And I was like, I really missed, I missed the mark on that title. <laughs> I should have put it in the beginning. But so the second book is Beyond the Pill. It is all about how to care for your body, being on birth control, getting the information you need to decide is birth control best for you to understand why it is you might have these symptoms going on and how to come off of it in a way that doesn't result in your skin freaking out, your periods going missing, and you feeling absolutely awful. Because we know 60% of women are using the pill. So just about 58%, uh, to be fair with the statistic, they're using it for symptom management, which means when you come off, those symptoms are going to come back. And so I wrote a guide so that you could be successful in coming off, but you could also take care of your body while you're on it. So you stand a better chance when you do decide to make that transition. And now this book is, is this normal, which is really a, it is the book that my patients and my audience on social media, the readers of drbrighton.com, this is the book they wrote. I like to say that because they guided everything that goes in here. It is all of the questions I get about, is this normal? Is this normal? And I was actually just texting with a friend last night and I was like, it's about sex, hormones, and everything your sex ed teacher should have said, but didn't. And um, he was like, amen. I, he's, he's like, I need a copy of that. He's like, you know, he's married. He's like, I'm, I'm married to a man, but I still feel like I need to know all of this information as well. And I was like, if we could have, more men on this planet being like female body literate, like what a world this would be. 100%. And the fact that we are still discovering this, right? Third in your thirties, forties, fifties, sixties, where women are like, why didn't I know this ever? Yeah. And I've been in this body this whole time. And typically you don't actually start looking for advice until of course you symptoms come up. Right. Yep. And then you're not being educated properly. So let's talk about sex. 
Yeah. Let's talk about it. Let's go there. I'm noticing a, not a trend, but of course you're a doctor. So you're talking about the body, the anatomy of the body, but there's so much emotion are wrapped up when it comes in, when it comes around to sex and your, um, and your health. So how do we know the difference between this is a health issue versus this is like an emotional relational issue or challenge? Does that make sense? Oh, that makes so much sense. And let me just say that, uh, they usually go together. Um, and it's not usually just one. I figured you were going to say that, but, <laughs> but right. It's trying to figure out like, you know, sometimes you can figure out the chicken egg situation, right? Like you can actually be like, no, in fact, the chicken did come first. Um, but okay. So let me, let me explain this. So it, I actually have in my book, a 28 day program that I take you through your charting. Um, you're charting your cycle. Yes. That might be the moment everyone yawns like, Oh, charting my cycle. I don't want to have a baby. No, but you're charting it like not only about your symptoms and, and where you're at, but like, how is your, you know, you know, sex life? Like how are the expectations playing out throughout your cycle so that you can start to understand the hormonal component of things because your hormones are changing across your menstrual cycle. And with that, Nipple sensitivity is changing, clitoral sensitivity is changing, ability to get aroused, um, sexual fantasization, um, fantasizing. So you're going to be fantasizing more around ovulation, your ability to orgasm. All of this changes throughout your cycle. And so there can be these cyclical changes where sometimes it's like, um, you know, you see this meme going around where men are like, how come women can be into us one minute and next they're not? And uh, some brilliant woman answered and said, bro, we were ovulating. And it's so true because ovulation, that is going, you know, that is going to be like when estrogen and testosterone really get to stimulate everything. And then once you ovulate, what's left behind the ovary is the corpus luteum. And now here comes progesterone and progesterone's like, we just want to chill. I make a joke in the book. Like you may be thinking like getting into some sweatpants is like a much better idea than getting into their pants during the luteal phase. And so you can track these things and understand, are these things normal for me? Is this true for me? What does it look like through for me throughout the cycle? And then I have an entire book, like uh, chapter in the book that's about libido and talking specifically about your archetypes. So are you someone that's more responsive desire or are you someone who has more spontaneous desire? I talk about the sexual excitation and sexual inhibition model, which is basically, I, I just call it the gas pedal and the brakes, like, and how sensitive are those? And there's a quiz in there. So you can figure that out. And what all of that discussion is about is about this emotional stuff that we're talking about, because for women, sex isn't linear. We actually want sex for different reasons and it can change during different times of our cycle. So sometimes we want sex because we want to connect. We want to bond. We want to feel close. Some of us get stressed and we want sex because that, that's going to dissipate the stress for us. Others are like, I just want an orgasm. Like I just need to come so bad right now. That's all normal. Those are all normal things. So, you know, to answer your question, how do we know if it's emotional and how do we know if it's hormonal or, you know, something else going on? It's, it's generally both going together because our desire changes throughout our cycle, but we have to understand that there's a circular sexual response model. Um, that really helps us understand that there's so many ways that women enter into the thought of having sex, like the engaging and having sex. There's so many things that can hit our brakes. So our partner adding to our stress can hit our brakes. Our partner um, being critical or not like not giving us the love and the praise that we need. Um, being self-critical of our body is, is major turnoff for ourselves. It also can hit the brakes on arousal. And when you're in the moment, it can take you out of that mindful practice that is sex, have you spectatoring, and now you can't reach an orgasm and you're so frustrated. And then so you're like, oh, I'm worrying about you know, oh, what does my body look like in this position? Can they see my roles? What about my cellulite? Trust me, nobody's looking at any of that because the brain is flooded with hormones. It's like, I'm, I'm in sex. Like they don't, they, at this point, nobody cares, right? But we care. And then we start to struggle with like, oh, I'm not able to get there. What's wrong with me? Why is it taking so long? Why, why can't I have an orgasm? I must be broken. Something's wrong. So does that kind of help illustrate? It doesn't totally. So to answer your question, we would need several hours to be like, how do we really differentiate this? One thing I'll say is a really easy one. 
if you have pain with sex, we've got a physiological problem. Like we have got a problem down there. Is it low estrogen issues? Is it just lubrication issues? Is it vaginismus? And so that's something that understand that you need to see a provider for, and you need to get that worked on because you're never going to have enjoyable sex. And it will, no one wants to have pain. So why would you want to have sex if the association is that's pain? Yeah. As you're talking, this is what's, so I come from like the emotional model, like the therapy background Mm -hmm. and it is fascinating to me. One, as you're talking, the lack of education as a woman that I even have around my own body, right? You have to consciously seek it out and educate yourself, right? Books, podcasts mm-hmm. are a great place to start advocating for yourself when you're talking to healthcare professionals. Then you have this life aspect of it. And I find sometimes we are either seeking, like, I need to know what this is. This is a hormonal issue. And we're avoiding looking at like the emotional stuff or the Mm stress, like the life stressors, like the lifestyle stuff and vice versa. Or we're looking over here and we're not looking at the hormonal stuff where everything is like holistic. We have to look at our whole selves. But as you're talking, this is what's going through my head. If you want to feel fully alive, if you want to have the best orgasms of your life, you need to like own it. You need to take responsibility Mm -hmm. and you need to be like, is this like, is there something going on that I need to go to a healthcare provider for? Or is this something that I just need to like surrender and just own it? Like I want Mm -hmm. this and I need to advocate for myself. I'm curious the, because I'm sure there's, Obviously, there's a lot of shame around this conversation. So what have you noticed either while writing or while your community sending you DMs and they're talking to you? What are you noticing are some of the most shameful, embarrassing questions that people are asking about their sexual health? Oh, that is such a great question. I do want to just acknowledge for a moment that you hit the nail on the head when you said people are always looking at the hormones no matter the gender people come to me if she's not into it it's got to be a hormone problem and i often and and as you said the emotional piece the emotional piece and the stress may be what led to the hormone problems and so i actually talk about that in the book and how there's a whole pyramid about how to work your hormones and there's so much on stress reduction the introduction of the book, which I was laughing with my husband, he got a new book. And I was like, how's like, did you read the introduction? And he's like, I never read the introduction. I'm like, nobody does. The introduction of my book, I talk all about from the moment that we learned about our bodies, the very first lesson was they are shameful things. They are shameful. Whether we pee, we poop, we have BO, uh, we have periods, like it's all shame, right? And so when you add in sex, which is arguably one of the most vulnerable acts that we have, I would say actually being honest with your partner and sharing your life aspirations and who you are is more vulnerable than sex. Um, but sex is physically very, very vulnerable. Some of the most shameful things. So queefing is one thing that, that I think women, they get very ashamed of like when it happens and not really. And I even, I even put something up on the, on Instagram not too long ago. And I was just taken back by the number of women who were coming in shaming being like, Oh, if you ever queef, then you need to get your pelvic floor fixed. You need to, you know, go to Pilates. You need to do X, Y, and Z. And I'm like, okay, firstly, I've had like two kids, but I remember the first time I ever queefed, I was, I was a teenager and I remember I was laying on my back. I pulled my knees to my chest and I rocked up as we do. Um, and a cleave came out and my friends in the room all started laughing. They thought I farted and I didn't know whether I should explain where that actually came from. But then I remember, and I didn't because I was like, better they think it's a fart because that's really weird. Like I didn't know that could happen. And I have so many people sharing that story with me. The other thing is vaginal odor, being very insecure about vaginal odor. And I will say being insecure about vaginal odor odor, when you recognize you live in a society that you're inundated with marketing about how bad you smell, right? We've got Vagicel, Vagicel being like, you need to put some stuff up there and you need to douche it out because you should smell like a clementine. No, bro, I should not smell like a fruit. Like that's not normal to smell like a fruit. Then we've got, you know, people that are like, um, 
you know, here's the spray that you can put down there. Here's vaginal melt. So that they are having oral sex with you. There's a different taste. There's a different smell. And really, I mean, you've got scented pads and tampons. There is so much marketing. Like, how much marketing is there for making sure that like men's, uh, you know, groin smells, okay, arguably much sweatier beings? <laughs> I just like, as well, soon as you were say, as soon as you were describing that, I was like, "There's no marketing for for it to smell nice and fruity down there." No, when, yeah, no, fascinating. And my goodness, like when I saw uh, there was like this like TikTok story time going around trend where so many women were talking about how they had to tell their male partner about how they needed to wash their butt, like they had to wash their butt. Yes, and how many men? were refuting that you never needed to wash your butt. I was like, they're not even washing their butt. And we're being told that we need to smell like vanilla and roses and lavender and all of this. Patriarchy, I mean, patriarchy. It is 100%. Anytime people are like, no, we've come such a long way in society. I'm like, walk, walk down a feminine hygiene aisle. You're still back in the 1950s, friends. Like, no. So vaginas should smell. You actually have a signature scent. They should smell and they should taste like vaginas. That's totally normal. And like, nobody talks about that though, right? Like all we're doing, all we're inundated with is like eat, po- and I actually bust these myths about like eat all the pineapple and then you'll taste good and smell good. Like there are just normal ways that you should smell and you should taste. And then in the book, I, I have a whole chapter on discharge where I take you through like what different odors are not normal? So if you have a fish-like odor, this is always where whenever I see men on social media uh, being like, oh, yeah, look at her. She needs to close her legs. It smells like fish. I'm like, you really are telling on yourself about how uneducated you are about the female body and how inexperienced you are with women. Like, yeah, like, and I had this moment where I'm like, I don't want to shame them, but like they're out there trying to embarrass women. And like, it's I'm embarrassed for them. I like secondhand embarrassment for them. Because if there is a fish-like odor, then you have an imbalance in normal bacteria that belong there. Most commonly is Gardnella. That's a case of bacterial vaginosis. And it's not even your vagina that's making that smell. It's the organism releasing a chemical compound called amines that gives that fish-like odor. This is something that we should treat. We need to treat that. That's not you. It's a bacteria and it's a normal bacteria. And it's a result of pH disruption. And guess who disrupts the hell out of your pH? Semen carriers. Like these people making their deposits in your vagina are causing a disruption in your pH. And sometimes if you have like, you know, a really good night and you've gone a couple rounds, your vagina can only handle so much alkaline material coming in before she's no longer acidic. And now we've got an overgrowth and that's nothing to be ashamed of. Uh, a lot of the times it's like, you know, I'll just ask my patients, well, did you have a good time? They're like, yeah, I had a really good time. I'm like, <laughs> like winning, like, like you had a good time. And then there's this like, yeah, okay, byproduct. That's like not so fun, but it's easily treatable. I love this. Hey, I just want to take a minute and talk about today's sponsor, AG1. Um, If you've been following me for a while, you know that I have slowly become obsessed with this product and it has now become a everyday staple in our home. It costs you less than $3 a day. You don't have to worry about taking a ridiculous amount of expensive uh, supplements. Of course, I'm not a physician or a healthcare provider, so talk to them first. But I am the type of person that always, always forgets to take supplements. And so AG1 has just become a daily part of my routine. They have amazing travel packs. So when I'm traveling, I bring that with me and I pour it in my water almost every morning. And for the boys, I sneak it in their smoothies. And so AG1 is going to be gifting you um, a year supply of their vitamin D and also some travel packs if you are a new customer. So you can head on over to athleticgreens.com forward slash EU for emotionally uncomfortable. And let me know if you try it. Tag me on Instagram. Um, I love the taste. It's an acquired taste. It doesn't taste super sugary. And um, yeah, it's just one of those things that I notice when I'm not drinking it. And 
I love shit that I use. I like to pass it along. So check it out. Athletic Greens, A-T-H-L-E-T-I-C, greens, G-R-E-E-N-S dot com forward slash E-U. So I'm just, I, in my head, it's like, just reclaim the orgasm, reclaim the orgasm, the shame around all of this. I can see the benefit of why your book is supportive for every one and education. I also see it. I don't know if it's just through the lens that I've been working with around, um, women and oppression and, you know, taking back your power, but why we need to know these things. It goes so much deeper than just, I want to orgasm or understanding Mm -hmm. your body. Like this goes so much deeper, the complexity of it. Okay. On the other side of this, you have an empowered woman, right? She's like, I Mm -hmm. embody my sexual health. I know what's going on. I've read all the books. I am, I advocate for myself. How do you see, do you see any correlation or connection with the work that you do and life fulfillment in other areas of their life? Well, uh, ask it in a different way. I'm not sure I'm totally following. So with the work I do, you're asking like, if they I'm, I'm are- trying to, like, The correlation between our sexual health, our, our mm-hmm. physical health, um, women's mm-hmm. health, and how that- can portray like confidence in other areas of our lives. Oh, uh, okay. Okay. I thought that's what you meant, but then I was like, don't go off on like a tangent. If that's not really what she was asking. So thank you for the clarification. So, um, most certainly that if you, so if you're doing the, what feels like impossible sometimes work of loving yourself unapologetically, I actually have exercises of, and I recommend if you're going to do this. Uh, so in the book, I say, around ovulation, get in front of the mirror and write down what you love about yourself. Like tell yourself what you love and then write it down because that's the phase where you're really feeling yourself. Like you're, you're curvy, you're voluptuous, your lips are more full. You have less fine lines and wrinkles. And that is a time where you're going to, you're just going to feel your best and your energy is going to be highest. And then in the times where you feel down, which is usually going to be like the week before your period, you can go back and remind yourself that yes, indeed, you do love these things about yourself. And I think if you've already done that work, this really does translate. We see this where you're much more confident in life. You are like, you see women, whether they are mothers or they're in corporate or, you know, they're entrepreneurs, you do see them setting their boundaries, knowing their value, knowing their worth, um, and being just coming from a much more grounded place. Like, um, I was talking with someone and they're like, maybe this book is like, not so much for like moms because, and I was like, why do we treat it? Like moms shouldn't be sexual or like a mother who's fully in her power, isn't going to create like an, an awesome future generation for all of us. Like, why does that get left to the wayside? And then on the health front. So we know that if you are engaging in regular sexual activity, if you are having orgasms regularly, This helps optimize hormones. It's good for your immune system. It's good for your neurotransmitters. It's good for your pelvic floor. Something that doesn't get talked about a lot is that the the clitoris and the pelvic floor, they need stimulation. Otherwise, we can have atrophy and we can have dysfunction developed. And when we start thinking about it from like the emotional perspective, the, if you think about the pelvic floor, it's, it's like this. And if people can't see me, it's a bowl. And I think about how we store stress in the body. And really, this is the end, right? This is you fell off the the tightrope walking and there's your net to catch you. And we can store a lot of trauma, a lot of stress. So, you know, everyone always talks about stress in your shoulders. Sure. You can be storing stress in your pelvic floor as well. And so this is where, you know, reaching orgasms or just having pleasure because orgasms aren't necessary for a really good time and for you to express that you have had satisfaction and pleasure achieved. Like this is per the research, but paying attention to that area can help with releasing that stored energy, those stored emotions and working some of those things out. And I know many women 
who they will do me- like they will i mean i know patients who are like you know they call it sex magic where they're having orgasms and then they're manifesting and they're just aligning everything um patients who are you know sexual trauma survivors who are working in that area um to bring pleasure sensation back and the sensation being pleasurable but also just to release the the trauma they feel like they have suffered and incurred in that area I do recommend if you've ever experienced sexual trauma that you work with somebody who is a trauma informed mental health provider, because, um, this is some serious, like you can stir some stuff up in there and having support system is everything so that you don't get stuck. But back to your point, absolutely. Like when you do that hard work, which, I mean, I think like, it's really easy for us to be like, here's the best way to have orgasms and here's the best way to have pleasure and all of that. But to forget that it is that one of the biggest breaks for us, what keeps us out of pleasure is that mental, emotional state is the negative things that we have been told and inundated about sex and about the female body from marketing to media to doctor's offices that keeps us away from pleasure. And that's not the easy stuff to work on, but that is some of the most gratifying stuff. And when you've cleaned house in that aspect, it is absolutely going to free up energy, just like mental energy alone, so that you can really pursue the things that you were you were brought here to do. Love it. Read the book, have sex, masturbate, orgasm, all the things. Learn more about your body. <laughs> it will change your life. End of discussion. <laughs> so, Dr. Julian Brighton, where can everybody get your book? When's it coming out? And I'm sure you have some goodies for them as well. Yeah. So it'll be available April 3rd. If you grab it ahead of time, you can go to drbrighton.com slash is this normal. And we've got a free digital cookbook for you, which is four weeks of meal plans, taking you through your cycle, helping you eat in a way that aligns with your hormones and supports them. So you can optimize, optimize your pleasure, but also optimize your hormones. It's a literal sex diet people, but not like you're fasting. (laughs) It's not a fast. (laughs) You are, you are going to eat in a way to enhance your pleasure. And then you can find me at drbrighton.com. You can find me on Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube at Dr. Jolene Brighton. And I would really love to hear from everyone. If you get a copy of the book, what were the big aha moments or what really helped you? I love that. Um, you give so much value. I follow you on Instagram and you're just, you are truly being of service to the world. And I just wanted to say thank you because, um, yeah, it can feel lonely or like you're lost and the value that you put into your books and the work that you do. I just wanted to personally say thank you. Oh, well, thank you. And I appreciate all the work that you're doing. I see you out there on <laughs> navigating the social media frontier and you have this wonderful podcast, which I just think is so, so valuable for women to have access to. Thank you. Thank you. This is how we create change, right? Just one person at a time that's doing the work and then we're changing the next generation. It's like awareness and education and implementation is where the magic happens. Absolutely. All right, everyone. The details will be below um, in the show notes for this podcast and go get your copy. Tag, if you are listening to this episode, tag uh, myself at Heather Chauvin and Dr. Jolene Brighton as well. Um, this is how we we support other women is just by education. And it is fascinating to me how many times people ask me about hormones or women's health. And I'm constantly redirecting them back to uh, people like Dr. Jolene Brighton. So thank you. Thank you. Are you a six to seven figure revenue generating business owner who is craving more ease, more alignment, and definitely more profit in your business? Well, guess what? I have been leaning in towards having these conversations about owning your value, understanding sales and marketing from an authentic feminine approach. And I have decided to have a private conversation about these topics. So I'm starting a private podcast called Emotionally Uncomfortable Attracting Profit. So head on over to Heather Chauvin, C-H-A-U-V-I-N.com forward slash profit. 
P-R-O-F-I-T. If you are a six to seven figure female founding business owner, you're going to want to check it out because I'm talking more strategy over there. I'm talking bigger picture. These are conversations that I've not yet had on the Emotionally Uncomfortable podcast. Go over there, check it out, and we'll see you on the inside. I was overwhelmed with life in general and outward expectations of what I thought, quote unquote, had to be and what I was showing the world. And I just knew something felt off. I knew that there was more to um, me and how I could show up in the world. Heather's approach is, it's like a bear hug because it's, She's the most lovingest, kindest person ever, but she holds you accountable for yourself and your actions. And I've never heard that before. I've always had been enrolled in programs or tried self-help where people are like, I'll fix all your problems. And Heather's program is really different because it was like, hey, I'm going to help you fix your problems. I'm not fixing your problems for you. And I think that's probably a harsh reality that I was finally ready to hear. So Heather's program was so different in the way of how she showed up for me on this journey, learning how to trust myself. I think what made me hesitate the most, if I was to look back, what I blamed it on was financials. But looking back, I can see that I didn't believe in myself at that point. And I needed someone to show me that I can believe in myself and help build my confidence in that way. So I think that's probably what was the scariest thing for me is someone actually holding me accountable to what I wanted. Heather gave me a super simple tool and held me accountable to doing that. And it held such power. And I think Heather's just taught me like with the breakthroughs, it's usually simple actions that I'm resisting. 